السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد سمع الله قول التي تجادلك في زوجها وتشتكي إلى الله والله يسمع تحاوركما إن الله سميع بصير الذين يظاهرون منكم من نسائهم ما هن أمهاتهم إن أمهاتهم إلا اللائي ولدنهم وإنهم ليقولون منكرا من القول وزورا وإن الله لعفو غفور والذين يظاهرون من نسائهم ثم يعودون لما قالوا فتحرير رقبة من قبل أن يتماسا ذلكم توعظون به والله بما تعملون خبير فمن لم يجد فصيام شهرين متتابعين من قبل أن يتماسا فمن لم يستطع فيطعام ستين مسكينا ذلك لتؤمنوا بالله ورسوله وتلك حدود الله وللكافرين عذاب أليم صدق الله العظيم As we have finished the 29th and the 30th juz Today we inshallah we are studying the 27th juz of Al-Quran Al-Kareem And the first surah is called Surah Al-Mujadala. Mujadala means argument, a dispute. And because the beginning ayahs of Al-Quran Al-Kareem of this surah are talking about some type of conversation that was going on at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in fact between Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and a woman. And therefore the surah is named after the same conversation as Al-Mujadala, the dispute, the argument. In order to understand the background of the surah, and the background of at least the beginning ayahs of the surah, I have to explain one ruling of the Sharia ah so that we can understand the background of the Surah and at the same time the message of the Ayahs properly. There is a word in Arabic language or that is a word that is used in Islamic rules which is called zihar. Zihar means is driven from the word zahar and zahar is the back. And zihar means according to the Islamic laws a person saying to his wife you are like your back is just like the back of my mother. Which means you are haram on me, just like my mother. This is called zihar in Islam. And not necessary that the person will say like my mother. It will be any of those close relatives that are haram for us to marry any of the maharim. Like you are your back is just like the back of my sister, my grandmother, any of those maharim that are that is haram to marry. But normally, it was a tradition from the days of Jahiliyyah that people to divorce their wife, they used to use this word, Anti Aliya ka zahri ummi. You are just like the back of my mother, which means your back is just like the back of my mother, simply means you are haram on me. 
This was considered the worst form of talaq in those days. The ruling of zihar is nowadays in the Sharia of Islam that if anyone will make this zihar, will say to his wife that you are just like your the back of my mother or things of this kind. That will, that, that will not be considered as a divorce anymore. It won't be considered a talaq. But this person is not allowed to touch his wife until he will pay the ransom that the ayahs will talk about and inshallah we will get to them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the ruling of zihar. Now going back to the background of the surah, as I said, in the days of Jahiliyyah, Zihar was considered one of the worst form of talaq. And there was no way of taking the woman back after making the Zihar with, with her. After saying talaq to her, still there was a room of taking her back. But after this Zihar, there, is, there was no way of taking her back. As Islam came, the rules started changing. But there was no order and no ruling received by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about zihar yet. And an incident took place where a sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made zihar with his wife. The wife went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, my husband made the zuhar with me, which means he told me, Anti alayya ka zahri ummi. You are just like the back of my mother, you are haram on me. I mean, this is what it means, but literally means your back is just like the back of my mother, which means I am not allowed to have any relationship with you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her, Harunti alayhi. And her name was Khawlah bin Tathalabah radiyallahu anha. Her husband was Aus bin As-Samit radiyallahu an, who was the brother of a great Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ubadah bin As-Samit radiyallahu an. So she came to Khawla radiyallahu anha, came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she asked him this question, Ya Rasulullah, what's the ruling about this in Islam? <coughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her that you are haram on your husband. This is a divorce. Because there is no new order have been received, so he is continuing with the same order that was there. She said, Ya Rasulullah, he never uttered the word talaq. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you are haram on him. Ya Rasulullah, I lived with him for such a long time. Now in this old age, he comes and he says these words. And there is no room for me to get back to him. Ya Rasulullah, there must be a way for me to go back to him. He says, I don't know of any way. You are haram on him. She raises her hands. That Ya Allah, I complain to you about my situation. Ya Allah, you can see that I have nowhere to go. Ya Allah, accept my prayer and find a way for me, make a way for me. She comes back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again the same words, that he never uttered the talaq. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I haven't received any new order about your situation. So I have to keep the same ruling that we have been following up to now. And now again she raises her hands. Ya Allah. There is always revelation coming to your Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Here I am a poor woman who is stuck in this situation and no revelation is coming regarding my situation. Ya Allah, help people like me also. 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam with these ayahs of Al-Quran al-Kareem. Qad sami'a Allahu qawla allati tujadiluka fi zawjiha. Allah heard the conversation or the statement of a woman who was arguing with you about regarding her husband. Wa tashtaki ila Allah. And she was complaining to Allah. Two things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about her. She was arguing with you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, regarding her husband. And the second thing, she was complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu yasma'u tahawurakuma. Allah was hearing your conversation. Inna Allah sami'un basir. Indeed, Allah is the hearer and the knower. Aisha radiyallahu anha says, تبارك الذي وسع علمه كل شيء وسع سمعه كل شيء glory to Allah who can hear everything and the details of each and everything she says I was sitting beside Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when she was talking but I missed some of her words as she was going fast with her conversation she was upset I missed some of her conversation, some of her words, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I heard everything, and not only he heard it, when Allah is saying, Qad sami Allah, I heard it, he is not, of course he hears everything, he doesn't have to tell us that I heard this and this, he's hearing everything, simply this means that I responded to that woman, and I answered her cry, and I corrected her situation, and helped her in, that, in her situation. During the Khilafah of Umar radiallahu anhu, once Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was going with a group of Sahaba radwanullahi alayhim ajma'een. An old lady came, she stopped Umar radiallahu anhu, she started talking to him. She had a long conversation with Umar radiallahu anhu. And not only that she have questions, she asks few questions, then she keeps on giving her statements and her advices to Umar radiallahu anhu. And thus it became a long conversation and all the Sahaba behind Umar radiallahu anhu, all the other people are waiting for Umar radiallahu anhu to continue his journey and they can continue, they can follow him. After she finished, some Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'een and some other people asked Umar radiallahu anhu Umar, Amirul Mu'mineen, how come you gave her such a, so much time? Everyone was waiting behind you and you spent such a long time with this woman, this, with, with, with this old lady. What was the reason and we saw you paying so much respect to her? Umar radiallahu anhu said, don't you know who she is? She is Khawlah bint Thalaba radiallahu anha. She is the one about whom Allah says that as she was talking to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I heard her talk and I answered her talk and I answered her prayers. How come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would do all of this and you want Umar to refuse to talk to her and not to accept standing with her while she, is, she has to make her statement, she, has to, she wants to talk? I can never refuse to talk to this woman. If she would have continued talking to me the whole day, I would have stopped over there. I would go for salah and come back and continue listening to her conversation because Allah heard her. So who is Umar not to hear her? This is how much respect Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'een used to have for the ayahs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah says, Sami Allah, qawla allati tujadiluka fi zawjiha. Allah have heard her. Then who are we not to hear her? And here, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this lady, this old woman, Sami Allah qawla allati tujadiluka fi zawjiha. That Allah heard her conversation, which means Allah answered her prayer and because of this she had a special status among Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. If we for a minute come back to our souls, 
we would find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have really blessed us. Have really blessed us with a great blessing of His. And that is when during Salah, when Imam is telling us, Sami Allahu liman hamida. Allah would hear the person now, Sami Allah, the same words are used. Allah will hear the person who would admire him and we say, Rabbana laka alhamd. It's a hamd that we know is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there is same promise over there, Sami Allahu liman hamida. Allah hears the person and Allah will accept the prayer of the person who would admire Allah at this moment and right away we say, Rabbana laka alhamd. And of course, this tells us the status of those believers who are performing these prayers every day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hearing these people. So we have to hear them also. Sami Allahu liman hamida. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I heard the whole conversation of this woman. And because of her cry, of course, as the ayah says, Tujadiluka fi zawjiha. She was arguing with you regarding the situation of her husband. It wasn't that she was rejecting the order of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was pleading to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to find a way for her. That you talk to Allah. You have such a close connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why can't you find a way for me? Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Him to reveal something different about the situation because I'm stuck. So I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help me with my situation. So now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the ruling about it that those of you who would make zihar with their wives. Now, we understand what does zihar means. Making the wife haram on, on, on our souls by saying to her, you are just like my mother, you are haram on me just like my mother. Your back is just like the back of my mother and this was a word that normally they used to use, anti aliyaka zahri ummi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them, مَا هُنَّ أُمَّهَاتِهِمْ These wives do not become their, their mothers. By saying these words, they don't become their mothers. In أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ إِلَّا اللَّائِي وَلَدْنَهُمْ Their mothers are only those who gave birth to them. Those are your mothers. You cannot change your mother by saying to your wife that you are my mother. Or you are like my mother. And this reminds me of the statement that we hear from many people when they don't like to observe proper hijab with other ladies, they will say, oh, she's like my sister. I think we have to tell them the same thing. They are not your mothers, they are not your sisters, sorry. And by you saying these are just like my sisters or these are just like my mothers, or I call her my aunt, is not going to change the rule of the Sharia. And they won't become your mother or your sister by saying that. And amazingly, if these people would be talking to some other creatures, will still think that they can mislead them. Better word might be they can fool them. But when they are talking to men like us, and we all are of the same nature. And every man knows his nature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by nature created men and women in such a way that they both look for the opposite sex. And this is why people are getting married in the world. Otherwise we will take every woman in the world like our sister and our mother. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا هُنَّ أُمَّهَاتِهِمْ those who call their wives their, like their mothers, these wives do not become their mothers. Their mothers are only those who gave birth to them. And therefore, by saying these words, talaq will not take place. 
وَإِنَّهُمْ لَيَقُولُونَ مُنْكَرًا مِّنَ الْقَوْلِ وَزُورًا They are uttering an ill word and a lie. Whatever they're saying, it doesn't make any sense, has no reality behind it. مُنْكَرًا مِّنَ الْقَوْلِ This is an ill word that they are uttering. وَزُورًا And they are lying. And they should realize that this was a sin that they have committed. By saying these words to their wives. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is a lie. So once this is a lie, then you have to repent to Allah to get the forgiveness for it. And therefore he told us, وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَعَفُوٌ غَفُورٌ If you seek his forgiveness, Allah is most forgiving. So he will forgive your sin. But you have to ask for forgiveness for this. But now, as we know that this is not a divorce, is not a talaq in Islam anymore. The ruling of talaq will not apply to these type of words. But since he have done such an act that is considered as a sin in the Sharia of Islam, forbidden by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and of course, it will be hurting his wife also at the same time, and is not a good word to use to tell your wife that you are like my mother or like my sister in those cases. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala applied some type of punishment for it. And he said, because you said these words to her, you are not allowed to touch her anymore. Until you pay the ransom for it. And what is that? The next ayahs are talking about it. وَالَّذِينَ يُظَاهِرُونَ مِن نِسَائِهِمْ Those who would make the zuhar, who make the zuhar with their wives. ثُمَّ يَعُودُونَ لِمَا قَالُوا And they wish to free themselves from what they have uttered, from what they have said, from the statement they have made. So now they have to do this. فَتَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةٍ مِّن قَبْلِ أَن يَتَمَاسَ They have to free a slave before they can touch each other. They have to free a slave before they touch each other. First thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first ransom for that is tahriru raqaba. We have to free a slave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Islam have really emphasized a lot in freeing the slaves. There are many times a question that is still why Islam allows the slavery. I'm not going to go into that detail at this time. We talked about it many times before. But in brief for us to understand, that is the best way of treating the prisons of war. Once we capture people, the prisoners of war, when we capture them, Normally, what people do is either they apply the worst type of punishment for them, they keep them in prison for life, or they would kill them. So, either they would kill them, or the second thing is they would apply the worst punishments to them. So these people are really going suffering in such a way that human beings can never even think of doing something like that to other human beings. And at the same time, they are becoming burden on the society. That these people are in prison, we have to take care of them, we have to pay for those who are taking care of them, is an expense. And who's going to pay it? The taxpayers are going to pay it. So, it's an expense. And it's a burden on the society. Islam came up with a beautiful solution to that. And that is, don't waste their lives. Don't torture them. But at the same time, it's not wise to send them back to their homes. Otherwise, they won't even care about being captured and arrested. So Islam says, put them back into the society. Give them freedom that they can come back into the society. But of course, you can't just put them back there. So many people coming back into the society who have no shelter, no place to go, no relatives. What are they going to do? And these are the people 
who have been just captured and brought from other place. So they might do all the mischief in our land and 2,000 people are in one town. They are going to create a lot of problems. Islam says there is a solution to that. And that is, give one person to each family member or to each family, depending on how many people are there. So now, this person is back in the society and one family is in charge of one person that would take care of all of his needs. They are not going to just keep him in their home. He will be back into the society doing all the work like any other man does in the work in the society, like any other person in the society. But he will have some restrictions to make sure that of course he won't do something wrong. He won't go back and instead doing, uh, preparing himself again to come back and attack. So, taking all the precautions on this side, at the same time giving him as much freedom as possible. To the extent Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to these Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa or to any family of course till the day of judgment, who would have one of those people, one of those captives of wars at his home, that you have to feed them from what you eat. The same thing. You have to provide them the same dress that you wear. Some people saw Sayyidina Abu Zar radiallahu anhu wearing a dress where the top is of one color and the bottom of another color. His slave is working, walking behind him, beside him. They look at his slave. His top is also of the same, of the different color than his pant. And when they try to look at both of them together, the top of both of them is the same color and the bottom of both of them of the same color. So they asked Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, how come you didn't make one dress for each of you which one, with one color? So you are wearing, you, have, you are wearing white top, so, and he has white, uh, 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 pant, we, see, we can say what really it was the uh, thing that they used to, the sheet that they used to wrap around them. So he has the bottom, bottom part of his dress is white, the top part of your dress is white, so why don't you, uh, why didn't you make one dress out of both, uh, out of that one sheet? And it will be one dress for you and one dress for him of the same color. Abu Zar radiallahu anhu said, because the color is different, and the material might be a little different. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, provide them the same dress that you wear. And therefore I wanted to give him everything the same way that I have. So therefore I did not want to take the whole one color and give him another color, get a better dress and give him a different type of dress. I wanted to give him equal share of what I eat and of what I, I dress. And once they are back in that form, they have been raised in that form, they have been given all of these freedom, all of this freedom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning penalties of different things, freeing a slave. A person took a false oath. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the way to make up for that is free a slave. If you cannot free a slave, you don't have a slave, you don't free a slave, then fast for three days. So look at this, that a person has taken a false oath. The punishment for that is freeing a slave. What does freeing a slave has to do with an oath? But it's an encouragement to keep on setting these people free. See how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking care of these people. Those who are the enemies... They were fighting against us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them such rights that these people will not lose their lives for the rest of their life. They won't be burdened on the society. They won't lose their life. They won't be just sitting in the prison waiting for themselves for, for their death. They're back into the society. Because of this, if you look at the tabi'een rahimahumullah, you would find that the greatest scholars out of Tabi'een, during the time of Tabi'een, the greatest scholars of Islam were the captives of war of the time of Sahaba Ridwan either themselves or their children. Because this is how they took care of them.
Abu Huzaifa radiyallahu anhu, Huzaifa bin al-Yaman radiyallahu anhu, had a slave whose name was Salim. And who's Salim? Unfortunately, we are not aware of these Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. He was a Sahabi too. He's called Salim Mawla Abi Huzaifa. One of the greatest scholars among Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. Salim Mawla Abi Huzaifa. Akrama, the student of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, the greatest Mufassir out of Tabi'een. Who was Akrama? was a slave of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu. And if you start going back to the history, you would see that most of the great scholars amongst Tabi'een were either the captives of wars themselves or their children. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, those who would do the zihar with their wives, فَتَحْرِيرُ raqaba, They have to slay, uh, free a slave. That's the first thing they have to do. مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَتَمَاسَ Before they are allowed to touch their wives. ذَلِكُمْ تُوْعَزُونَ بِهِ Allah says, I'm advising you through this. وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ خَبِيرٌ Allah is well aware of what you do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that these are all for your own sake, for your own safety. I'm advising you to do all of this and to follow my instructions because they will be for your own benefit. They are not for the benefit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These, all of these orders of the Sharia of Islam, even the punishment that are applied by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course they are for our own benefit. But just like a child, who many times doesn't understand the punishment applied by his parents or teachers as for his own good. Same thing, many times we fail to understand that all of these laws of the Sharia are for our own benefit and they are not to benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't need anything from us. فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ شَهْرَيْنِ متتابعين. A person who cannot find a slave, of course, now we don't find slaves. So, فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ A person who cannot find a slave, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, now he can go to the second option. And that is, فَصِيَامُ شَهْرَيْنِ مُتَتَابِعِينَ He has to fast for two successive months. مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَتَمَاسَ Before they can touch each other. A person who cannot even fast. He might be too old, just like was the situation of Aus bin Samit radiallahu anhu, the same Sahabi. He said, Ya Rasulullah, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa called him, and he said, your wife Khawla is complaining, and here the, I received the ayahs of Al-Quran al kareem so you have to free a slave. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't have a slave. I can't afford to buy one and set him free. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, then you have to fast for 60 days, for two months. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm so sick that if I don't eat three times a day, it will be difficult for me to survive. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then gave him the third option, that is in Quran. فَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعُهُ A person who cannot even fast, فَيْطْعَامُ سِتِّينَ مِسْكِينَ Then has to feed 60 poor people. Now a question still can be raised, that a person, how about a person who cannot even afford to feed 60 people? Remember one thing, that there is no time period when the person has to pay the ransom. It's not that if he doesn't pay it within two months, four months, then it will be a divorce. As long as he doesn't pay, then he cannot touch his wife. But there is no time limit to that. Still, a person whose situation is saying that he doesn't think he would be able to pay. At least at, at this time he knows he cannot pay. And he cannot feed these 60 people. This Sahabi said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, I cannot. I can't afford to feed people, so many people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam helped him by giving him some of the sadaqat. That if you are so poor, then you deserve the sadaqah. So he helped him by giving him of the sadaqat 
and then he asked him to go and give it to the other people feed the other people so this is another way that then other people have to help that person getting out that out of that situation these laws are so that you can that, so that you would believe in Allah you have your faith in Allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam what does this have to do with this statement that Allah is saying for zihar you have to pay the ransom and these are three different options of course not option the, these are three different ways of paying it you go for the, for the, you have to go by the first one freeing a slave if you don't have that option you cannot do it you don't have a slave then you go to the second one if you don't cannot uh, fast for 60 days then you go for the third one but now Allah says, I'm ordering you to do all of this so that you have your faith in Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What does this mean? How would this make us have iman in Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? There are two different reasons for that. One is, as I mentioned, it was something that was carried out from the days of Jahiliyyah. And the ruling that was applied to it, that zihar was considered a divorce, it was from the days of Jahiliyyah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to keep some distinction between the rules of the days of Jahiliyyah and the rules of Islam. So he says, I'm keeping this distinction so that لِتُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ So that you have your faith in Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you realize there has to be some difference between those days and the rulings that came from out of Islam and the rulings of Islam. So you have to follow these rules of Islam nowadays and don't follow the other rules. The second reason for mentioning this is when a person goes through this type of situation and of course, we say whatever we say in those situations out of anger. And at that time when the person is told, he might right away, the wife says, now you can't get close to me and she might even if she doesn't know the order, she'll say I'm divorced and I'm going home, I'm leaving home or you have to leave home. And the situation is getting worse so he runs to the imam now. This is the time when people will remember the imam. He has a problem. So now he runs to the Imam. I have this problem. And of course, this is what he's going to hear. That this is what you have to do. Fast for two months. Oh, you people make everything difficult for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِتُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Follow these instructions. When these instructions are coming to you at that type of situation, this will test your Iman in Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that you believe in Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because in normal situation, everyone follows the deen. When there is no hardship, no difficulty, everyone will follow the deen. Our Iman is only tested the time when there is a difficulty. When there are some obstacles in our way. When we find that our emotions most of the times are not allowing us to do it, to follow the orders of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu And this is why most of the time we find ourselves disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the time either when we are too happy or too upset. Then is the time when person, the person totally forgets about the Sharia and the rules of the Sharia of Islam. This reminds me of a Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What an amazing hadith. It's a beautiful lesson for us of how submissive we have to be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how much respect we need to have for the laws of Islam, for the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sharia of Islam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was at his home. He heard two people arguing. He was at his home. He heard two people who were arguing in the masjid. The situation was this, that one person had borrowed some money from another person. Both of them are sahabi. Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One person had borrowed some money from the other person. 
it was his time to pay back the loan. So he's, this Sahabi called him and said, give me the money back. He said, I can't afford to pay it back now. At this time, I'm not able to pay it back. I don't have it. So can you please reduce it? Take just half and forgive the other half? He said, no, never. I want my full amount back. And I want it back now. And of course, he's upset. He wants his money back. And while they're arguing, the hadith says, فَرْتَفَعَتْ أَصْوَاتُهُمَا Their voice started getting loud. They are both shouting now at each other. I can't pay it. No, you have to pay it. You said it at the time and you promised. And it's going. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard this sahabi saying to the other one, the one who is asking for the money back. He's saying, Wallahi la af'al. The other sahabi said, can you please reduce it for me? He said, I swear by God, I would not do it. You have to pay the full amount. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went out. And he said to him, Man al-muta'alli ala Allah. Who was taking oath by Allah that he will not do a good deed? Reducing it, forgiving some amount of it is a good deed. You don't want to do it, don't do it. But don't say, well, I won't do it. Who was taking, who was out of you to, who was taking the oath that he won't do a good deed? So of course, there was no way for him to say that, I didn't say it. He said, Ya Rasulullah, Ana. Ya Rasulullah, I said it. He's too upset at this time, remember, that their voices are getting loud on each other. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is out there, and he just asked this question, Man al-muta'alli ala Allah, who took oath by Allah, la yaf'alu ma'roofan, that he will not do a good deed. He said, Ana ya Rasulullah, ya Rasulullah, that was me, and now, right away, he continues to say, he didn't stop. Now, I'm giving the option to pay as much as he wants, and the rest of it is forgiven. Subhanallah. Look at that love and respect for the Prophet of Allah. He didn't ask him to reduce it. He didn't say anything to him. He only asked him, why would you take an oath for not doing a good deed? Don't use Allah's name for not doing a good deed. Don't take oath for that. As he mentioned that, the Sahabi was afraid that he might say something more now to me. Ya Rasulullah, let him pay as much as he want. The rest of it is forgiven. In that situation, to have, to be that submissive and to forgive your right, which even Rasulullah wasallam, of course, the maximum he would have said is just give him some more time. But he cannot force him not to take his loan back. You know, so I paid it to him, I gave it to him. But this is how much respect. That shows the respect that was in their heart. That if that respect wasn't there, at least at that situation he would have said, yeah, okay, I'm not taking the oath, I will pay uh, whatever ransom I have to do for my oath, but he has to pay his money back. No, Ya Rasulullah. Let him, now I give him the option. He doesn't even have to tell me now. Whatever he likes to pay, that's his option now, the rest of it is for you. This shows the great love that Sahaba Ridwan Allahi Ali Majma'een and the respect these Sahaba Ridwan Allahi Ali Majma'een had for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the respect they had for the laws of the Sharia of Islam. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is telling us ذَلِكَ لِتُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ This order has been given so that you believe in Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam وَتِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ these are the limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These limits are set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, we should just stop at these limits. We should not commit these sins. If we have committed the sin, then we have to pay whatever we have to pay for it. وَتِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ وَلِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ And for the kuffar is a painful punishment.
ان الذين يحادون الله ورسوله كبتوا كما كبت الذين من قبلهم دوز هو ريفيوزد هو ريفيوز تو اوبي الله اند هيز ميسنجر صلى الله عليه وسلم دوز هو ديس اوبي الله اند هيز ميسنجر صلى الله عليه وسلم Those who do not like Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The word hadda has all of these meanings. Hating them, disliking, and not obeying. So therefore, we should be very careful when we are hearing the message of the ayah. The main, mainly the ayah was revealed about the kuffar. Because they are on the extreme of it and that is... Disliking Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And although they might claim, yeah, we like them, we admire your Prophet. We wrote books about your Prophet. We like him. He was so nice. Islam is the best religion. But still, they will be considered of those who are disliking Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because they dislike the orders of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They do not follow them. So those who dislike Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or those who do not obey Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam كُبِتُوا كَمَا كُبِتَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِمْ So I was saying, although the ayahs are mainly about kuffar, but they can even apply to those believers who do not obey, who refuse to obey Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam كُبِتُوا كَمَا كُبِتَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ There will be disrespected, they will be humiliated, they will be disgraced. كَمَا كُبِتَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ The way people before them were humiliated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about those who do not like the orders of Allah, who do not like the orders of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As I said, mainly they are kuffar. And that's the attitude of kuffar. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, these people will be humiliated, just like the kuffar before them. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed those kuffar before them. How He humiliated those people. But at the same time, the ayahs will apply to those who are refusing to obey Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Unfortunately, we have got to a situation nowadays when people of those who claim to be the followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they hate the look of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's not only that they don't follow, they hate it. They disapprove of it. They don't like to see it existing anymore. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, Kullu ummati yadkhuloon al-jannata illa man aba. Look at the word ummati. My whole ummah will enter the jannah except for those who would refuse to enter the jannah. My whole ummah will refuse to enter the jannah illa man aba except for those who would refuse to enter the jannah sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi majma'in were surprised wa man ya'ba ya rasulullah who would refuse to enter the jannah allah is telling him to go into the jannah he says no i want to go to hellfire who is going to do that wa man ya'ba ya rasulullah who is going to refuse to enter the jannah ya rasulullah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, Man ata'ani dakhal al-jannah. A person who obeys me will enter the jannah. Wa man asani faqad aba. And who disobeys me, he's refusing to enter the jannah. Allah is telling him, that is the jannah over there. Just follow the steps of your Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you are into the jannah. And he says, no, I don't want to go there. He's refusing to enter the jannah. So, and of course, remember this also, most of the times when we 
think about following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have limited that following of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to such few things that many times sisters think it's only for men. Because they have to grow, grow their beard, they have to dress like Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or they have to do these things. No, no, no. It's not limited to these things. In everything that we do in our life, there are instructions from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How the setting of our houses are, how we eat, how we drink, how we do all of the things that we perform in our lives. All of these things, there are instructions about from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about them. So, following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be following him in all of these things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and of course, at the same time, I have to clarify this. It doesn't mean that if a person is not following all of the sunnahs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would have this punishment of that Allah says that they will be humiliated. But remember, this is a rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the sunnahs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will bring the respect back to the ummah. Following the steps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the way to bring that respect back to the ummah. And we are not looking at only at individuals, we are looking at ourselves as an ummah. When the ummah will come back to it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give the ummah the honor and the respect. And when the ummah, as we see the situation, we all almost have agreed to disregard the sunnahs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from our day-to-day -day life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kubitu kama kubita ladina min qablihim. Whoever would do this, the same rule will apply. It applied to the people before you, it will apply to these, this ummah also, that these people will be humiliated the way previous nations were humiliated. We think the honor and respect will be in changing the deen. And many times people feel that honor and respect will be in opposing Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Displeasing Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will get us the honor and respect. No. Kubitu kama kubita ladina min qablihim. Those who disobey Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they will be humiliated just the way people before them were humiliated. Allah says, وَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا آيَاتٍ بَيِّنَاتٍ I'm revealing clear ayahs to you. Why does he have to say this? Why does he have to say the ayah is so clear? Because he's telling us, look how clear it is, and still you don't agree, and still you don't believe, and still you don't want to follow it. وَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا آيَاتٍ بَيِّنَاتٍ We have revealed very clear ayahs. وَلِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابٌ مُّهِينٌ And for the disbelievers is... Humiliating punishment. يَوْمَ يَبْعَثُهُمُ اللَّهُ جَمِيعًا فَيُنَبِّئُهُمْ بِمَا عَمِلُوا The day when Allah will resurrect all of them. All the people one day will have to come back. In this life, some people may think that we have seen people opposing Allah. We have seen people opposing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Still they have a lot of respect. They are not humiliated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you will see the reality of it, يَوْمَ يَبْعَثُهُمُ اللَّهُ جَمِيعًا The day when Allah will resurrect all the people. And then, فَيُنَبِّئُهُمْ بِمَا عَمِلُوا He will inform them of what they have done. أَحْصَاهُ اللَّهُ وَنَسُوهُ Allah kept the account of it, and they have forgotten it. We forget what we do, but it's in our record. Allah is keeping that in our record. It's all saved over there. Ahsahu Allah. Allah have saved it. Allah have kept, the, kept it. Wanasu and they have forgotten about it. Wallahu ala kulli shayin shaheed. And Allah is witness over everything. Some of the Mufassireen, as they explained, Inna alladheena yuhaddoon Allah. Those who hate Allah, those who oppose Allah, those who do not obey Allah, 
That's a, this means this referring to Yuhaduna Awliya Allah. Those who hate the friends of Allah, which means the virtuous believers. Those who do not like the true believers and the virtuous believers. Those who hate to see who hate to see some good people practicing deen amongst themselves and within themselves because they feel that these people don't belong to us nowadays. And of course, that is a fact also that exists. That there are many times when people don't like to see people following deen amongst them. And that can even go as far as we are in a group of people. Most of us are ashamed to perform the salah and one person comes up and he says, let us, let's pray the salah. And he starts performing the salah. Sometime we may even feel that it was good if he wasn't with us. Look at him. He's performing the salah over there. People will laugh at all of us. This is disliking having a person who's practicing deen amongst our souls. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith which is in Sahih al-Bukhari Man aadani waliyan faqad aadantuhu bil harb A person who carries the animosity against any of my friends I declare a war, I Allah declare a war against that person So according to some of the Mufassirin this ayah is referring to those people who hate to see practicing Muslims and virtuous Muslims among themselves May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from all of his punishments and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us to Surat al-Mustaqeem. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us to the path of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and give us tawfiq to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'ir al-muslimina wal-muslimat wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.